just finished a concert when I was, I, around about the time she died, I began to have this very powerful dream. And uh, it was this young woman. And, uh, you know, in the dream, here was this beautiful young woman. She was free, she was happy. And I had a sort of had the feeling that, you know, this was a woman to be reckoned with. I, I don't, you know, I can't explain why I felt that, but here's this beautiful young woman and she was joyous, she was free, she was happy. And, you know, it, it took me most of the evening to, to, to kind of figure, figure out who this person was, because I was used to taking care of my kupuna mom, my 83 year old mom. This is my mother before my brother and I were born. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, think she just came to tell me that everything was okay. And then I understood the butterflies. You know, butterflies start off as this ugly sort of cocoon and then they emerge and they become beautiful creatures, free, you know. There's a metamorphosis, a transcendence, and that is what my mom had done. She had transcended the cocoon of old age. the first grandchild and my grandmother Helen Deshea Beamer of Hilo named me mm -hmm. Kapua Ilohia Manono Kalani Eono Eiku Epua Iala Iluna Ilalo Ika Ilio Keka and great grandma would say, not too high, not too low, just right. A <laughs> balu. You think, what are we laughing about? There's so much joy, it's just bubbling over. Lovely. My kaido, my kaido. Eva. Bumu. Bumu. Nuku, 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 She's a living embodiment of, of what it is to be a Hawaiian. Auntie Nona, you know, is actually the, the root of everything. Auntie Nona is the essence of aloha. You are with her, you sit next to her, you feel her mana just coming out and it, it hits you. How does one create one's meaning in life? I mean, we can have great talent or great skill or financial resources or no financial resources and no skills but how about that this human being was loved how about that uh, 
at the end of your life, you will not alone. My folks started their love affair when they were like 12 years old. My dad was 14. And my mother was 16 when I was born. My dad was 18. So they're on the beach before they got married. And my father says, oh, when we get married, where would you like to live? And you know how little kids are kind of playful and they run around and she went around in a circle. She said, there. And it was up in the Heights. I live a Heights. And funny that my great grandfather would have land up there. Uh -huh. Nona was always actually one of my heroes before I even got to meet uh, Keola. And what was really remarkable about mom to me was she had a way of drawing people out, drawing them in, but also drawing them out, drawing, out, drawing them out of their shells. And she led people, as she did me, uh, to do things that perhaps you never imagined yourself doing before. My early recollections were Napo'opo'o, and that's a little fishing village south of Kona. My father was a fisherman, and my mother taught school. But we left Napo'opo'o when we were ready to go to school. And my father decided that we should all learn to speak good English. So we were all uprooted, taken to Honolulu to attend English Standard School at the Kapalama on School Street. And then we went up to big school, up to Kamehameha. So we had to grow up to go to Kulanui, the big school. And there were five of us. I was the oldest. My brother Kiola was the baby. And he was born there at the house with a midwife. And my mother said, oh, Nona, take the children out to play. So I took the four children and we climbed up the house tree outside my mother's window. And we looked in the window, watched him being born. <laughs> he looked like a little monkey. Oh, he was so cute. But we all sat up in that how tree and, and watched this little brother being born. I never had a doll. There were five children in the family. And there was a lot of kids to take care of. And I always had little kids to take care of. So I never had a doll. And I thought many, many times how sweet it would be to have a little dolly. So I wrote the song about a little doll. <laughs> my doll, my baby doll, I hold you in my arms. I rock And I think Auntie Nona, me personally, was an inspiration and I made a giant impact in my life. Uh, at several levels of my life. When I was a kid, you know, going to Kamehameha, she was one of my teachers, you know, and then as I entered college, and as I entered my career as a uh, artist and an entertainer, she would always uh, make these uh, uh, secret visits, always being in the back, you know, background, never coming forward and presenting yourself as, I'm here, you know, and I would, real sneaky like and it was really cool to uh, know that she could be a lady of her stature could be that humble and you know didn't need to be recognized so that kind of stuff just made an impact on me in the same way that I would portray my life you know like don't have to always be under the spotlight you know can be low-key can be underground you know and don't have to say too much about yourself and just let uh, 
it exudes from yourself and exult out of your heart. So when I look at Auntie Nona and what she has taught, not only me, but um, her family as well, yeah, is how to convey that Aloha spirit uh, in a universal way so that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sound too kue or too aggressive or imposing and at the same time it doesn't it doesn't uh, sound too laid back and uh, uh, undermined yeah but what it does is is uh, her presence has taught us to stand firm you know and uh, you know stand firmly as as a god or as god would have you stand yeah and and that stance is love yeah and it, and it echoes it echoes through everything and every movement that uh, you make and that's what uh, she gave to Hawaii touch the lives of many, many people. We, we jump on the airplane and, you know, everybody's saying hello to Auntie Nona Bima. Oh, I was in your class, Mrs. Bima, when I was, you know, 10 or something, you know. So, I mean, she's touched the lives of countless people, countless children here in Hawaii and mainlanders too. I travel to the mainland for, to do a workshop, in, you know, for Auntie Nona or for somebody else and everybody says, oh, how's Auntie Nona? How's Auntie Nona doing? Oh, yeah, I, she, I was in a workshop with her, you know, 25 years ago or something, you know. And, and I learned this thing, pupu hinu hinu, and you know, it's such, I love it so much. So she's been spreading aloha for, you know, her whole life. It's something that's very precious to Hawaii. It's something that is Hawaiian, aloha. But if you don't share it, it can't spread and, and it might diminish. So to Auntie Nona, aloha, the compassion is not only for the people, but it's the compassion of aloha for the culture and for the traditions of the Hawaiian people, hula, olelo, oli, you know, uh, crafts and other skills, all those things, those are what she has aloha for. I went to kindergarten in Hilo. It was Japanese school. My grandfather was a merchant. And he decided that if we went to Japanese school, we could go with him to collect his bills that they owed him at the plantations. So then every Saturday, he'd pile us into his station wagon, and we'd go to the plantations from one Japanese home to another to another. And while he was selling pots and pans, we were playing. Ichini, Shangchi, Go, Roko, Hichi, Hachiku, Ju, Ichini. And to this day, I remember all those songs. From five year old, I remember those songs. And the first time I sat at a piano, and I what my grandmother played, my father played. And I sat at the piano and tried to do, uh, and I remember doing, do you know this little song? There was a crooked man, he walked a crooked mile, he found a crooked sixpence against a crooked smile. He caught a crooked cat, which caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a little crooked house. I don't know, but Grammy used to sing these little songs to us. So I sat down at the piano and I began to sing. There was a crooked man. And that was the first thing I remember fingering. And it was just the, the tone that pleased me. I think we had privileged Hawaiians around us. Grandma's friends were very soft-spoken. And they were very ladylike. They were very quiet. Well, they drank their gin. <laughs> Slugged down. She didn't drink, but uh, she always had it for the ladies when they came. 
and they'd do their dances. Wow, their dances were so beautiful, but not without the gin. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, of course, and I always had to take care of them, so I'd make up stories. But we had this big pune that I told you about, and I'd look out, uh, Papa had it on the lanai, and I'd look up at the clouds, and I'd make up stories, what was happening. Could this figure, this figure, and my brothers would, oh, and then of course they'd fall asleep half the time. But it was a nice way to make up stories by uh, imagining what was uh, the picture in the clouds. Mm -hmm. Grandma taught me the chant, told the story, and did the chant in minor. But it was such a beautiful story. And I didn't realize that it would be spooky until I saw the children's reaction. And then I thought, I have to do something about it and just add that one note. But yet that, uh, hadn't, uh, that hadn't been your reaction when you heard it from Sweetheart Grand. No. Well, I had been used to chanting. We chanted everything. Long before we began singing melodic things, Lili Ue no Ho Nani Mai, we chanted everything all the stories, so that sound was natural to me. I had no feeling that it was spooky. Mm -hmm. But to the uninitiated, it is a spooky kind of a monotone, you know, monotone sound. You know? But I began to put a lot of little melodies. My cousin Mahi was a beautiful falsetto. So we wanted to do this in New York at Carnegie. So I put this melody to <laughs> pretend you're listening to Mahi with his falsetto. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Kei kabai ula o mana na nui hola ia o kamda I can't sing it. Di 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 di. And did nice you, you were you the one that put the, the melody line to that? I did. Mm. I did. Uh, Eva hine holo lio o wehela maluna o kina. It's the horseback riding, you know. But it just seemed to need a melody to ride the horse, you know. Women of our Hawaii, in my opinion, have always been the, the hallmark of um, or the bastions of, we can use that word, bastions of, of preservation. And they always had that ability to uh, guide the men where, they, where men should be going. <clears throat> she was um, a mentor, and there were several mentors in my life, and they were all pretty much women. And um, at the time, she was still uh, a teacher up at uh, Kamehameha Schools. And so she asked me to come up to the office and she says, oh, I have a collection of Hawaiian music and you're welcome to look through them and I'll talk with you. And, and uh, it was from that visitation that I found um, the lyrics to Ipule Manu, Emana Ohe Aloha is another title. Well, that song I recorded, Ipule Manu, has become a, a very through the decades has been probably one of the most popular of the songs that I've ever done. And I, I thank Nona for being there when I needed the guidance and she brought me to a song that has meant a lot. Well, Mrs. McClellan was a teacher, but every now and then Auntie Nona would come in as a substitute. And it, it was from that point that, that she started to touch my life. Meeting Auntie way back when I was 12, would make a profound difference in my life and in all the lives that I touch. Because in my school of Hawaiian music, some of the things I teach, again, like malama, 
Aloha, Olu Olu, things like that. I started learning from her. It's hard to, to describe it. You need to be there. Yeah. It's hard to describe it, but if you're there, you look at her, listen to her, uh, you don't need to describe it. You will feel everything. Yeah? You will feel that mana, the deep sense of place in that lady and in her own hand. Oh boy, you know, she embodies so much of the aloha spirit and you just feel it when when she starts to talk and she's so happy to see everyone. It's her spirit. <laughs> After uh, Kamehameha, I had a scholarship to go to uh, junior college in Colorado. Colorado Women's College, and then I had a fellowship to go to Barnard in uh, New York and uh, Columbia, and it was different. And then to New York, well, a little cold in the winter, blocks of ice floating down the Hudson, ho, 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 ho. and a little hot in the summertime. But uh, New York was a lovely experience. Enjoy the culture, the opera, you know. Oh, Rockefeller Center, the rockets, and there's a wonderful Christmas tree and the skaters at Christmas time. And all the animated windows all along Fifth Avenue. It was a, a lovely time. Then, of course, along comes the war. Eleanor Roosevelt was a good friend of our dean, and she used to come to teas on Sunday. So she had just started the neighborhood houses in Stuyvesant Center. She was working on um, UNICEF at that time. So she asked if any of us would like to go down to the neighborhood center. Oh, we were so thrilled we were gonna get to go with Eleanor Roosevelt. And then she was worried about the uh, Hawaiian Islands being cut away from food supply during the war. So it was her idea to start an emergency feeding department where they would stock food in all the school cafeterias. Powdered eggs, powdered milk, uh, spam, K rations. So she asked if you know we'd be interested in helping that, so I came home to do that. So I just got off on 4th Street, and I stood there and I thought, oh, somebody's going to come along that I know. And a friend came on a mutual telephone truck. <laughs> hey, Nona. And by then, my family had moved to Waikiki because of my mother's business. So I went home with him, Salhopi, in the uh, mutual telephone truck. And my mother was so surprised. Why didn't you tell us you were coming home? We couldn't tell anybody we were coming. So, and there had been some nuisance bombing in Waikiki. So there was a big hole just a, about a block away from the house where a bomb had fallen. It was kind of spooky. And I felt kind of sad for my family having gone through it. My father had been working at the Naval Air Station, but luckily it was on Sunday, so nobody was working at that time. But uh, it was uh, very traumatic for the family. And of course for my mother, nobody was taking hula during the war. It was not a necessity, you know. So. Business was a little bit uh, difficult. My mother had a hula studio. Beamer hula studio. <laughs> we didn't call them halau at that time. And then of course, more influx of, of the tourists after the war and uh, oh, a lot of hapahauli music and teaching this little brown gal in the little grass skirt in a little grass shack in Hawaii. <laughs> so it was a whole different kind of music for us and, and teaching a lot of hapahauli things. And um, there weren't many Hawaiian families that were coming to take hula. It was mostly the affluent haole kids. Uh -huh. Business began to pick up and 
And little by little, uh, things began to normalize. After the blackouts and after the barbed wire was all removed from along the coastline, you know, and uh, it was uh, kind of a sad time, but little by little, things began to regain some normalcy. And then the families began to come out of the woodwork and all beginning to band together and we began to see more of the Hawaiians coming to Hula. But in the meantime, we had a concert group that uh, I organized and presented it at uh, the Art Academy, the first time we'd had a Hawaiian concert group. Went to neighbor islands. It was kind of educational. And our premise was that uh, we were going to go to colleges and universities and present concert-type hula, because all they knew was yakuhula hikidula and, uh, you know, carnival with a little gardenia and a little gardenia. And we thought, we've got to elevate the culture and show them that there was so much more value than just yakuhula hikidula. <laughs> we were sponsored by the San Francisco Dance League. So we came to San Francisco. And they rented a beautiful mansion for us on Knob Hill. It was a gorgeous place with marble uh, statuary in the garden and velvet draperies and a staircase. You know, the boys had one wing and the girls had one. There were 10 of us. And a lovely fireplace and a wine cellar that wouldn't quit. But it was a, it was a lovely uh, kind of experience for us in uh, San Francisco. And then by then, we had contacted colleges and universities across the, the country. And I thought, how are we going to get there? Because we didn't have money. So we bought an old hearse <laughs> for $150. So I knew we had a lot of bodies we had to put in this car. So it was a long hearse, it had two differentials, and I got in it, and I thought, boy, this is a classic car, you know, because it was so much car. And it had a heater in it, it had a baggage rack, we could put our drums and spears and everything up on the top. <laughs> and my brother says, oh, you got to have a name for her. I said, be gone, be, be gone, yeah. And we wrote a silly song. It's a great song. Kika a never never holo aku holo mai ka baggage rack my iluna ka broken door on the driver's no hoanala ke holo ne be gone be gone ya. The engine cuff with an eke for to keep her warm. The radiator boils like Pele. Elohe kako ka rumble in the front and back. Away, away, poor old begonia. And we wrote verse after verse wherever we were. Poor old begonia got so tired that she just gave up. Eholo ne ika garage. They said for $80 we could easily fix her up. Away, away, no eighty dollars. <laughs> it's kind of silly. Hi, na iya ba hi na kapua na la ka bags rack by iluna ka broken door on the driver's no ho on the la ka holo ne be gone be gone ya be gone be gone ya beep beep. <laughs> Isn't that silly? That was a shortened version of the song. <laughs> it goes on Drastically and on shortened and because on. there are many verses in there. Yeah, oh, it's so it funny. Picture this. Honolulu, Kamehameha, Kapalama, 1974. I graduated in 74. But I think I was lucky enough to take one of those Easy A classes, I heard. So I took Hawaii chant and dance as a freshman and I met this wonderful lady who never got cross, never, like, maybe she got disappointed in you, and she expected us to be fine, young Hawaiian women. She explained to us the trials and tribulations of being a woman, uh, 
they had to like sit down and dance when she was at Kamehameha. And she explained to us the process of how we came from just women that were unseen and unseen, unheard, until she was like quite a little creative person, you know. And she's quite a little icon for Hawaiians, for girls, for people who respected the culture and the hula. And you know what else she was? A fabulous storyteller. Well, we were known as the Pele dancers, so that our focus was Big Island and the dances of Volcano. Uh -huh. So we would do some of the prayers and chants. Oh no paha e kai no wa e kai ka iku ana kau i kanu e hapa hapa ai e hapa hapa ai apa i ke ki hi o ki lau e a i lai la ku ka ma o ku lu i a ke a e pe. So it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. bursting in the heavens and it was one of our family mottos no ke no to persevere <laughs> no matter what obstacles keep going persevere no ke <laughs> so it was an interesting experience for us to reinforce our own values and to help people understand that there was more to the Hawaiian culture than just the little gardenias and Yakahula Hikidula. <laughs> Pearl Buck was a good friend of my grandmother's, and so she had made arrangements along the way. Her association was the, uh, uh, she had brought Eurasian children to America, and she had the Pearl Buck, uh, I think, was a children's association. Pearl Buck Eurasian Association, where she would place all these children in homes in America. So she was so good, was able to uh, get us into Carnegie, and we had a concert at Carnegie. We thought it was just so fortuitous that we knew this wonderful lady. The dance associations were very intrigued, and uh, accounts that came in the paper wondering, what were we doing? and they wanted to know the kind of chants, they wanted to know the translations of the words, why were we doing this chant to Laka, who was Laka, and we got some very interesting feedback from the dance community in New York City. So we had interviews and would we go to this college, would we go to this school, and things began to open up. And then um, put my brother Keola, into Columbia University, my cousin Mahi in Juilliard, and we drove Begonia all the way back <laughs> and sold her $450. <laughs> so the whole trip didn't cost a thing. We got our $150 back. <laughs> so it was a very interesting experience. And of course, came home to uh, a little more enlightenment. And we felt that uh, the visitors would now have a little more knowledge coming to Hawaii. That we wouldn't simply just uh, have visitors that were completely uneducated, you know. So we felt we had done a lot of good. So that was 48, 49. <laughs> and then I met my Irishman and got married. <laughs> and then comes Keola, and then comes Kapana. <laughs> So they were very interesting years. But it seems as though the pendulum has swung all the way now, where we had so much trouble convincing people that there was value in the culture. And now we can't keep up with it. Oh, thank the dear Lord. Thank the dear Lord. Well, Auntie Nona uh, was a, uh, a true uh, 
a true respectable Hawaiian, you know, when whenever there was discord or disagreement with Hawaiians, they never were was blunt, you know, there was never a confrontation. So what you did, you did by action. So she was the first to do the stand up hula and she was criticized for that up to come in my school now. And so it wasn't it was only recently uh, beginning of the Renaissance, or even uh, some years before that, that uh, you know the stand-up hula was allowed at, at Kamehameha. So with her uh, respectable protests, by just standing up and doing a hula, she brought like a, a Renaissance to the Kamehameha school, and which caught, caught on like wildfire uh, during the regular Renaissance of the 70s. I went to Kamehameha and I wanted to start a Hawaiian club because we couldn't be Hawaiian. If we had a club, maybe we could learn something, we could chant. So I taught them this song. very special person and um, special in herself because she was such a sweet lady. She was also a very brave lady and you know was was not afraid to stand up for what she knew was right. She didn't need to bark or growl, you know. She was very sure of herself. I had started the Hawaiian Club at Kamehameha in 35. And um, in 49, they said that they needed an advisor. And I thought, well, all right. So I was on the Kamehameha payroll. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, that's good, because uh, I'd had a difficult time at Kamehameha when we wanted it to be a Hawaiian school. We wanted the language and the chanting and the dancing, and we couldn't do nothing. <laughs> but we did have poi once a week, and that was the consolation prize. But I thought, well, they don't really want me as a teacher, but they said, Nona Beamer. I had given them such a bad time, you know, trying to be Hawaiian and not being able to, and trying to do the standing hula, you know. Mm. But uh, it was interesting to start teaching at Kamehameha. And the students were beginning to ask, you know, who are the Hawaiians? Where do we fit into the scheme of mankind? Are we brown, yellow, green, purple? What are we, you know? It was a, a difficult time for the Kamehameha administration to admit that they were going to have to give in to the students and little by little begin to answer these questions by having Hawaiian classes, they didn't even know what to call it. So for 10 years, I was on half time. And I would just go up for one class or two classes, you know. But then finally they decided, and I don't know if it was the trustees, probably the trustees decided that we would have Hawaiian culture. So by then, we were a co-ed school. So we had the girls' school up on the hill, we had the boys' school in the middle of the campus. So. We were busing back and forth, and the girls could come down and join the boys, and the boys could come up and join the girls. So it evolved in a very natural way. And we had song contests every year. And we were so tired of having community singing while the judges were making their decision. So I said to the football boys, well, why don't we do some dancing or something? unbeknownst to everyone. So I taught them an island medley. So each island had its own color, princess, and its own dance. 
So the Kui and the waltz and the march and each medley was different. Well, it was such a sensation to have this as the whole Ike instead of singing community songs for this uh, break while the judges were deciding. And I thought, oh, they're going to put me in jail. <laughs> so I went to school on Monday and I pulled into my slot and I heard the, <laughs> the loudspeaker. Congratulations to Mrs. Beamer and the Hawaiian Ensemble for the whole EK. I thought, oh, I'm not going to be fired after all. But uh, the football boys were the key because they were so good looking and, you know, nice bodies and the way they sang and the way they danced, it was a winner. So from then on, we were allowed to stand and have an intermission during the song contest that has become so outstanding that people go to the song contest to see the whole Ike. <laughs> when I first discovered Auntie Nona, I, I read about how courageous she was in, at Kamehameha School as a teacher. And she just stood up and said, I'm going to teach them how to speak Hawaiian. I'm going to teach them about the Hawaiian culture. And I was like, oh my gosh, she just spoke her mind and she, she, she left a legacy there at Kamehameha School. And now um, learning from all what she did there is, is pretty courageous to me. Yeah. <laughs> Beamer, better known to all of us as Antinona. Kani. Why all Okani? Tutuahini was the source of all of us of bringing education, knowledge of ancient Hawaii to the present. Kani was one of our gods we believed in, and, and Tinona Tutuahini no Beamer was always there for us in not only in the connection of our gods but the spiritual language bringing back to us and the source of all the things that she brings to Hawaii. God of the sea, knowing that not only with the Amako rest, but knowing all the other things that makes us healing and healthy from the ocean. This was to Tuahini Beamer, making sure that the natural things that we have, to use it to the benefit of our life to carry on Kupuna's work. E mahalo i oi. E loko loko mai kai, e olo holo po mai kai. Mahalo ke akua, mahalo na amakua, mahalo tu puna e na wahine ke ola e na tutu wahine e nona bimber. Mahalo. E me ke olo po miana. From a lot of stories I've heard from people like uh, Jerry Santos and Calvin Ho and others that were her, her students in Kamehameha, they, she led them to do things that they may not have considered possible. And um, I think that was her magic and continues to, be, continues to be her magic, even though she's not among us in the same way. She still affects people the same way. She still is bringing things to our lives, still is encouraging us even without her being physically present. She, she continues to do it. Um, and I know that might sound odd, but just by the legacy that she's left, by the things she's already taught us, the things she's already dared us, the questions she's already asked us, um, she still brings that, you know, even not being here. And what a magical legacy that is.
lightly kick in the lead. Like among a cow on the kiki. You don't know who kill a She's actually a living treasure, man. You know, the thing is, in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of the, uh, all of the, all of our kupunas. You know, they start to, you know, to, um, to, to leave this place, and, and it's good that she's still here. But she, the Romanao is of, of, uh, of a time past that we don't, you know, we don't even, we can't even comprehend all the stuff that they see in their lives. So it's actually for us. It's, you know, it's like a blessing every time you know you get to talk to her, man. It's, it's, that's precious memories. I'm very blessed to have uh, gotten to sit down and, and talk to her. And she's just a beautiful woman. Now we have so many books, and but uh, I did have one book. It was written in 1908, uh, Unwritten Literature of Hawaii. My grandmother had given it to me in 1935. And it did speak of uh, of these chants that were taken from native speakers, and Dr. Nathaniel Emerson had recorded them in different types of hula. And I got very interested in types of hula. And we began sort of trying to catalog all the standing hula, the sitting hula, the different kinds of sitting, the different kinds of standing, all in the kahiko, in the ancient type and we had 242 different types of ancient hula. Not even the transitional hulas of the monarchy period, not even the hula awana of the modern period. It's just in the ancient. And it was so stunning to me, all the different animal dances, the different positions in the body. How do you sit? Up on your knees or squat? Or are you reclining? Or are you lifting halfway? Are your movements small? Are they medium? Are they large movements? So the categories and subcategories, and it became so fascinating. Different families follow different traditions, and the birth of the hula to us was on uh, the Puna coast, the big island, and we follow the Pele story, the Pele family, and all of the adventures of all the members of the family, and it's so rich. And, uh, literary content you know. and here again it translates beautifully for today's living you know that they went through this kind of uh, spirituality and had to have super strength to endure on different levels of humanness and different levels of uh, supernatural it's, it's uh, kind of boggles your mind when you think this was a whole different plane of understanding and now we're just beginning to come into it 
people have said it's so sophisticated, it's above the average person's mentality. Well, it may have been sophisticated, but sometimes the simple things are the hard things to understand. And the basis of hula is quite simple with the living philosophy of love and caring and sharing and understanding. And basic words like ike, not just to see with your eyes, but to see with your soul, or with your heart, for enlightenment, for understanding. It's a beautiful way to live. Hula embodies all of those values and makes them real. I was curious about different types of hula. And she brought this pig to show me about the pig dance. I don't know when I had more fun. I must have been eight or something like that. And we sat out there by the garbage. <laughs> Because every Saturday she used to burn the tangles that she collected from her hair, keeping it in a lauhala basket. And every Saturday we would sit out there by the trash and burn her, her hair, the tangles. I think it was a carryover from the old days when they were afraid to have their hair or their fingernails. Somebody would cast a spell. She was a good Christian woman. But every Saturday we did that. So they built a little pig pen right out there for this little pig. And we had more fun watching the antics of that little pig. Well, we would watch what it did. And then she would show me in the chat how the pig scratched its opponent. <laughs> and how it tried to stand up. And it was so momona that it couldn't get up off the ground. And she'd go, uh, 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 uh. I've had more fun with that dance for, what, 75 yep. years. Yep. But I learned about this pig dance and the whole raft of animal dances. Shark and dog and birds. And I thought, isn't that remarkable? To come out of the water like a shark and open your jaws. And, oh, it was thrilling. And she was very light. Her body was very, very light. It was fascinating. Hula is such a basic way of life, and there's so many avenues that it will, will travel. But wherever it goes, it makes perfect sense in your life. It keeps everything pono. That there is a balance, spirituality, emotionally, physically, everything you do is pono. And it's a lovely way to live, uh -huh, to keep everything in balance. Difficult challenge, difficult challenge. And we have to work at being the best damn human beings we can be. <laughs> pono, pono. <laughs> so in my heart of hearts, I just hope we have a little more time. A little more time. <laughs> I'll be 85 in August. <laughs> my mother was 93, so I thought, well, maybe I have a few more years. So go get them, Nona. Go get them. <laughs> That's what the Vima family has been doing all this time is taking a seed of tradition that they've had within the family for all these generations and, and nurturing it. And now the time has come for it to flourish. During Helen de Shebima's time in the you know, 30s, 40s, she was, she was allowing the seed to flourish in the form of beautiful songs, lyrics, incredible lyrics, incredible music that went along with these lyrics that's even hard for to sing nowadays. You know, you can hardly sing some of those songs. They're so beautiful. And 
uh, and she played a beautiful piano, so she allowed that aspect of it to come out. And, and she, she kept hula close to herself too and, and taught it to, to Danby, that's Auntie Nona's mother, who then carried it on and Auntie Nona took directly from a sweetheart grandma herself, uh, Helen de Shebima. So that tradition of hula then flourished with Auntie Nona and storytelling and, and sort of love of traditional Hawaiian stories and culture, legends, and Auntie Nona created quite a number of great children's stories, legends, that are taught to kids all over the islands. And so I think, you know, each generation has been adding a little bit. And then, of course, Keola and Kapono bringing out slack key and, and music, thinking of those great themes of love of your father or love of uh, the land, you know, Mauna Kea. You think of the song Mauna Kea. You think of uh, uh, Hawaii and we are her sons. And, and you know, those kind of really good um, songs that helped the renaissance of Hawaiian music, which then led to the renaissance of Hawaiian language. So I think that actually the Bima family, in its own way, one of many, many families here in Hawaii that have done this, but the Bima family has brought out these, these little seeds that have been carried through from the ancient days when things weren't really supposed to be shown, you know, uh, and now they're, they're able to flourish and, and each member of the family has been doing it in his or her own way. It's been sort of a lifelong pattern of living for our whole family. And I think now that this resurgence has occurred, it's beginning to be more of a pattern for a lot of people, Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian, that the values are so solid and they're so firm and rich. That's the way to conduct our lives in the Pono manner, where everything is in balance the spiritual, the philosophical, you know, and I think it's a wonderful way to live. Auntie Nona has um, brought a lot of insight for taking care of children. Um, she, she gave me the thoughts of ideas of how to capture their imagination in, in plays, in hula, and she also gave me the thought of they're only going to be children for one time, and and so I live by her, her thoughts, and I, I appreciate all that she's done for me, and especially teaching me how to be humble. And hopefully, I will pass on the legacy of Auntie Nona Beamer. I, sometimes I think she doesn't even know how special she is, yeah, because she's on the inside looking out, and we're all on the outside looking in. And, um, you know, we, we all cherish her so much, yeah. And Auntie Winona, she did so much for the Hawaiian people. She passed on the legacy of her language, history, music, and like I said, Keola and, and Kapuna, they're doing the same. As a student, you're only as good as what the teacher is. So she, she brought a lot to me uh, and into who I am today. Don't forget aloha. Malama ka aloha. You know, the love. Take care of the love. And Auntie Nona had that. She had that that uh, that instilled part of her being is the love. And that's who Auntie Nona was, you know, this person filled with aloha. But she was uh, She was brave, you know, and, and you know, I think aloha also encompasses standing up for what you know is pono, what is right. Auntie Nona did that. Aloha wau ya oi e Auntie Nona. Mahalo nui. She's such a, a treasure and um, it's really hard to describe her, you know, she just exudes aloha. She um, perpetuated the Hawaiian culture. She was Hawaii, you know. She did everything to, to uh, keep our life, lifestyle, our way of life uh, going. She's really a remarkably beautiful um, influence in our culture so much strength and, and aloha. You know, love has always been the motivating factor of everything she does. Never about money or never about 
you know, professional advancement or ego or any of those things. It's always about trying to help people. But this, you know, this aloha, this love is, is the underpinning of her life. I had the, the honor of sharing my life with her. Many years ago, before there were people here, the Pacific Golden Plaba, the Kolea, and the sweet Kahuli, the tree snails, were good friends. They lived here happily. And the little Kahuli would crawl along the floor of the forest and sip the sweet nectar from the Akolea fern and feel their opu and creep way up to the trees and fall fast asleep. They were very happy. One day, people came here. Big ships came here. And pretty soon, animals with big feet came here. And they were put into the forest to live with the Kahuli. They were so frightened. How can we climb along the floor of the forest and seek the sweet nectar? So makau, oh, so frightened. Oh, wait, what shall we do? Let's ask our friends, the Kolea birds. Kolea, Kolea, ki'i kawai. Will you go down to the stream where these beautiful Akolea? Will you bring the sweet nectar up? the tops of the trees for us. And we promise we will sing to you every night of the full moon. And they had such beautiful, sweet sounding voices. And this is the song they sang. When we were growing up, Mom always mentioned the phrase Malamako Aloha, keep your love. And she'd, you know, remind us constantly, hey boys, you know, Malamako Aloha, and, uh, and later on as we became adults, the same thing. And by doing this, she was trying to um, help us understand that Aloha was more than a word. It was a way of being in the world. It was a way of living with compassion. I used Kapua Ilohia because I didn't know I had that end part of the name until my grandma wrote a song for my wedding. And at the end of the song, it was Kapua Ilohia Mano no Kalani. And I didn't realize that she had given me that ending to my name. But uh, I was uh, honored to have the Manono at the end of my name, one of our ancestors. She and her husband, Chief, High Chief Kekua Kalani, were involved in the last war. The last war fought in Hawaii was 1819 at the death of Kamehameha I. And her husband and the young Kamehameha II were at odds with each other. The young king under the tutelage of Kaahumanu wanted to abolish the kapu system and uh, you know the religion. And Kekuo Kalani did not and he had a substantial number of Hawaiians that were in accord with him. So the two cousins fought a battle on the lava fields of Kuomo in 1819. And Manono wanted to fight at the side of her husband and he said, no, but I will fix a haliipunana, a little bird nest of fern. So he gathered the uluhi fern and fixed this nest for her where she could watch the progress of the battle. And very early, she saw the husband. He was struck by a musket fire, and she saw him fall. And of course, she ran down wailing, And she covered his face with his cape, and she took up his spear into the battle. And she kept chanting, Ko aloha la ea, ko aloha la ea, malama ko aloha, malama ko aloha. 
keep your love. There will be no obstacle for Hawaii if you keep your love. So I'm pleased to bear the name of Manono. She was talking about keeping your love for the old ways of Hawaiian religion and culture. But that sort of philosophical touchstone came uh, through me, through my mom, through her mother, through her mother, through generations. And it came to give us a resilience in, in, in life. It gave my mother strength to stand up against what she perceived were the wrongs in the way the Hawaiian culture was being treated in Hawaii, in the way, um, so many ways she had courage to stand up for what she believed in. She understood that Malama Koloha was compassion, love, but it was also strength and resilience. And so this was her um, beautiful philosophical inheritance that uh, we learned uh, through her influence and through her, the leadership of her life. So when she um, came to the end of her life, uh, I was remembering of her idea of Malama Koaloha. And so we floated a lantern with, with her name on it, and it was helpful to watch that beautiful light go up into the darkness of the Pacific Ocean and try to let her go. Out into the wind, I watched the setting sun, and I remember you. When the night comes in and the day is gone, I remember you. When the clouds appear and the wind grows cold, I'm missing you so much, it's time to let you go. for love, a time for letting go, and time for all the small regrets to pass, a time for love, and time for letting go of the past, a time for about Lili'u when they first saw the water sprinkler, you know, Kabili Vili Vai, and she saw this thing going around and all the water was sprinkling around. You tell us. Oh, I don't know, Ma. You know. Well, Vili Vili, <laughs> to twist, really to twist. So the water was twisting around, twisting around, and what is the song? The sound was 
kind of music to her ears and she just put the syllables the way that sprinkler was going around. But it's a sweet way to give birth to, to songs. So many things, like, like squeaky shoes. Mm -hmm. And they never had shoes. The first time they put on shoes, <laughs> they squeaked. And what's that funny song about the squeaky shoes? Uh, that's uh, Kolopa. That's a bit of a Kolohe song, actually. We have to smile. 